Once we had started counting our blessings, most of us could just go all day long, couldn't we? I want to let you know about another blessing that we have coming up April 30th through May 1st. There are some of these books, there are books out here on the, uh, the shelf, the, the counter out here in the foyer. Pick one of these up. This is about the Pepperdine Bible Lectures, which they no longer call by that name. It's now called Harbor. And it's hard for me to get used to that. <laughs> Harbor. It is the Pepperdine Bible Lectures. And we are blessed to have this right in our backyard. We have speakers. There are over 300 different classes and speakers, teachers coming from all over the world to present their classes, their lessons and series on, on pertinent topics for Christians. There are 12 different or 10 different keynote addresses. This goes on Tuesday night, starts on a Tuesday night and goes through Friday night. And it is rich. People travel to attend this from all over the world. And we have it right here in our backyard. And sometimes we take it for granted because it's so close. But I would encourage you to pick one of these up, look at it, really consider spending some time out there this year. May, April 30 through May 3rd. So just grab one of these out in the foyer and look at it. We are a blessed people. Because God has chosen us and he has given us his name. People who are Christians wear the name children of God. One of my favorite things to say is when somebody is baptized and they're baptized into Christ, I say, you're given a new name here. You're no longer child of so-and-so. You're not a child of God. And that is amazing when we think about what it took and the love that's required to do that. But God calls his children to purpose. He calls us to meaning, to activity. He calls us not just to wear his name, but he calls us to wear his name in a way that brings honor to him and accomplishes his purposes. He purchased us with his blood. He bought our freedom from sin. He bought our freedom from death. He bought our freedom into life with the death of his son. What do we do with that? It is an amazing thing. And here's what the people in the early church did. They took it to heart so much that they listened to the Spirit and they gave up their lives to profess Jesus' name and to spread his kingdom. And not everybody liked that. Not everybody was a fan of this new group that was teaching new things. And they tried to stop them. And as we've been looking through the book of Acts, we remember right here at the beginning of their ministry, the apostles were arrested. They're drugged before the leaders of the Jews. The leaders of the Jews were so angry at them, they wanted to kill them. When one of them stepped up and said, wait a minute. Slow down. If what they're doing is from man, it will what? It will fail. But if it's from God, you will not be able to stop these men. And I read that and I share with you every week, this weighs heavy on my heart. Because he has given us the same mission. He's given us the same purpose. He's given us the same gift. We are no different than those people in the early church. And he has given us the same spirit. He has equipped us with all the same gifts. And he expects us to use them in the same way to further his church. And if it will not fail, if it's from God, it makes me ask questions when I look around our country. There are bills in our government, in our state government right now, who are trying to quash Christianity, trying to stop any mention of Christ. We could rise up, we could carry signs, we could pick it in front of the Capitol building, but that's not really what God's called us to. He's called us to be salt. He's called us to be light. 
He's called us to be the influencers of people, the people in our circles, the people that we are acquaintances with, wherever that might be. And it's not easy, though, because we get caught up in all the things of the world, and it's a fearsome place today. You could be persecuted for mentioning the name of Christ. You can lose your job. You can lose your friends. You can lose so many ways when you stand up for Jesus. And yet that's what he's called us to. And so we're spending some time looking at the early church, looking at the way the Spirit worked through ordinary people to do extraordinary things. So join with me. We are in Acts chapter 27 today. We've seen how the Spirit has worked through the apostles and through the teachers and through different people. And the church has grown and it's not stopping. It is growing by leaps and bounds. People are hungry to hear the message of freedom, the gospel that Paul and all these other teachers are talking about. And we're going to see here today that Paul is in some tough times. You know, I hear people talk about fears, phobias, things that are irrational. And I'm sympathetic to some of those, but even more, I'm sympathetic to things that are, are rational fears, things that are real. Several years ago, <clears throat> I woke up on a, on a Monday morning, and there are these large black streaks running down my vision. Went to the doctor immediately, and he said, oh my goodness, you have a retinal tear and that's blood that's flowing down. Those streaks is what you see. And so they sent me right over to an ophthalmologist who was closed that day. They had to open up their office, especially for me, which I was very grateful for. The doctor looked at it and said, we need to do surgery right now. We're going to do a laser surgery. And I hear all about this LASIK stuff. That's not what this was. <laughs> I don't want to be too graphic here, but it was miserable. They shoot that laser beam right into the back of your eye, and it's like a bomb going off each time. But, but they had to do, I don't know, 20 or so flashes of that laser beam. And they said, come back in a week, and we'll look at it. Well, I went back in a week. They looked at it again, and they said, oh, my. You have seven more tears in your retina. We need to do a procedure that we normally send people to the hospital and put them under general anesthesia, but we don't have time for that. We need to do this now. And so they tied me into the chair. Straps around my head. You can't move. And they did this procedure they call cryotherapy. And I think they call it that because it makes you cry a lot. <laughs> I thought about telling you all about it, but I won't. Suffice it to say, it was one of the most miserable things I'd ever gone through. And they said, come back in a week and we'll look at it. <laughs> so I came back in a week, and I promised. I sat in that waiting room, and I prayed. Oh, God, I prayed. I do not want to go through this again. God, please, please, please. Don't make me go through this again. And he didn't. But I tell you, I praise God. I walked out of there. When the doctor looked in there and he said, ah, oh, it looks like it's healing. Had I not been trapped in that chair, I would have fallen to my knees right then. <laughs> God, thank you, thank you. Because it was so painful. And I was, I was scared to death about what they might say. But as scared as I was, I went back. Sometimes the, the things that you need to do are worth overcoming your fear. Sometimes the things that we need to do to procure, procure the best requires a tremendous amount of courage to do things that are hard. And not everything that God calls us to is easy. He never called us to an easy life. He never promised us that things would go well for us. He did promise abundant life. But we'll see here, abundant life sometimes means 
painful life. But God isn't concerned as much about our pain as he is about our life. And so he gives us life when we follow him, real life. So we pick up with Paul. He complains and he doesn't complain. He instructs the people in Corinth who have gotten a big head about themselves. They're so smart. They know everything. And they are living as if they know everything and have all the answers. And Paul says, you guys, look at the apostles, the ones that God has called. We are like the last of the world. We are the dregs of the barrel. We, we go around persecuted all the time. And he mentions he was shipwrecked three different times. We're going to look at one of his shipwrecks today. But he says, I was shipwrecked three different times. I spent a day and a night in the open sea. Maybe you ever spent a day and a night in the open sea just by yourself, just floating out there? That sea is big. It's hard to find anything out there. It's hard to find a ship out there, much less one person. It's big. But God took him through those things. And he gives praise to God. But realizing his shipwreck, he now has to get on another ship. Paul, we see, went by obeying the Spirit, took courage, and he went to Jerusalem, even though the Spirit told him it was going to be hard. He went there realizing, I might die, but that's okay. As long as I'm following what God wants. I might be persecuted, that's okay. As long as I'm doing what God has called me to do. And he went, and he was persecuted, and he was thrown in jail, and he sat in that Roman jail for two years on trumped-up charges. They weren't even real. And then the governor decided, we're going to honor Paul's request to speak to Caesar, and we're going to send him on this ship full of prisoners to Rome so he can be before Caesar. And Paul picks that story up there. <clears throat> and God gives him this task that is hard to do. does God call us to things and then make it hard? Have you ever asked that question? If God wants us to do something, he should pave the way to get it done, shouldn't he? Yeah. And then I think about Nehemiah, whom God put this vision on his heart to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall that had been torn down by the Babylonians. He took it on himself he said, God, I want to be faithful to you. So he left Babylon. He traveled to Jerusalem to these people who didn't know who he was. He looked at this city that was in ruins, and he said, we're going to build this city. He had to pull everybody together, encourage these people who had been just living with the torn down walls for a long time because it was a hard thing to do. And as they tried to build those walls... It got harder. Enemies didn't want those walls to go up. And enemies threatened them. And enemies discouraged them. And enemies attacked them. And enemies were all around and sneaking in the midst, the middle of them. And why didn't God make it easy if that's what God wanted done? But he doesn't. Sometimes he sends us through storms, through tempests, and billows that flow over our heads. And so we pick up with Paul as he gets in a boat. They head out on the sea, sea again. They've sailed for a ways. Everything went well. They determine they're going to go on further. But Paul speaks up and says, guys, I, I, I see in a vision this is not a good idea. I see in a vision God has told me that, that there's going to be storms out here. We should stay right here. But the seasoned sailors, they know better, don't they? They're the professionals. Plus the guys who want the, the, the cargo moved, They're, they've got a, a financial investment. They said, no, we're going to sail. And so they did. Guess what happened? The tempest blew. The hurricane force winds came and threw them off course. And for the next two weeks, they floundered at sea. And we pick up in chapter 27, verse 21. And Luke writes this to, it, to us. He says, after they'd gone for a long time, time without food. 
Paul stood up before them and he said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. I love Paul. He says, Guys, I told you so. I told you so. You should have listened to me. And they should have. But they didn't. But now Paul says, see, I, I have some credibility here. Listen to me this time. He says, now I urge you to keep up your courage. Because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith that God, in God, that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Okay, mixed news here. Good news, bad news. We're not going to die. Good news. We're going to suffer shipwreck. Bad news. Who wants to suffer shipwreck? Who wants to be lost at sea? Who wants to be thrown on the rocks? Who wants to go through this hardship? And once you're shipwrecked, how do you get to where you're going? Because your ship is wrecked. But he said, take courage. God's got a plan. And he spoke to me with an angel who said we're all going to live. God never promised that things would go easy. But he did ask us to take courage so that we can grow through what we go through. God is interested in raising us up and making us to be more than who we thought we could ever be. But he takes us through storms to help us to do that. Sometimes life gets hard. And sometimes being obedient to Christ makes it even harder. You see, a lot of us have the faith to glorify God when things work out and we get to where we're going. We see the results go, oh, thank you, Lord. But sometimes it's hard to give him thanks in the middle of the storm. Sometimes it's hard to sing and praise his name when things are falling apart around us, isn't it? It's hard to praise his name when we're hurt so deeply, we don't know if we can get out of bed in the morning. And yet, that praise is exactly what we need to do to remind ourselves of where our strength lies. I am weak. I am short-sighted. Unless God enables me, he is my strength. We lean on him. Paul prayed this, Philippians chapter 1. He talked to the Philippians. He said, I've been in jail. And people are taking advantage of the time. But here's the deal. He says, I will continue to rejoice sitting in this jail. For I know that through your prayers and through God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will actually turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul said, I have confidence in God. He didn't say he had confidence that everything was going to work out and go well. He said, I might die. Praise God. That sounds odd to our ears. But that was Paul's message. Praise be to the Lord if I'm sitting in jail. Praise be to the Lord if I die. Praise be to the Lord if I'm shipwrecked at sea. Praise be to God because he is live and he is active and he has given me his spirit, and he has given me his promise, he has given me his hope, and I've got a message to share. He had purpose to his life. We're going to go through storms, every one of us. 
Some of the storms could be from your own doing. Sometimes you're going to make bad choices. You're going to do things that bring storms on you. We do, we do that. But sometimes we're affected by storms from other people and the decisions they make, and they affect us. And those are sometimes even harder to understand. But sometimes the storms come just because this is a broken world. And sometimes things just don't go the way we want to go through them. You don't get to choose your storms. They're going to come. But what you do get to choose is how you go through them. You get to choose if you're going to grow through them or if you're going to complain through them. If you're going to take courage through them or lose hope through them. How will you approach the storms? Paul did this, verse 33. He said, before dawn, Paul urged all these guys on the ship to eat. He said, for the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food and you haven't eaten anything. Two weeks. Anybody fasted for two weeks? That gets to be a long time. You start losing strength. And it gets hard to function. These guys are in such a dire strait. The storm is so terrible. They don't even eat. And they're losing strength. And Paul says, now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. And after he said this, he took some bread. And he gave thanks to God. Right there in front of them all. And then he broke it and he began to eat and they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. They're in the middle of this storm and the storm is so bad the sailors haven't even eaten a bite in two weeks. And Paul, in the middle of the storm, gets down on his knees and gives thanks to God right in front of these men. I want to show you real quickly three ways that Paul showed courage. Number one, it took courage to trust that God is present in his present circumstance. In the middle of the storm, when even the seasoned sailors were saying, we're going to die, he said, thank you, God. What does that look like to these sailors? This man's a fool. You don't give thanks to God for this kind of treatment. You must have done something terribly wrong <laughs> to be treated like this. What kind of a God, if, if that's what love is, I don't need enemies, right? If that's my God, if that's my friend, I don't need demons. He's treating me bad enough already. And sometimes we think that way. Paul didn't. He said, there are storms in life. But God is in control of the storm. And I will give thanks to him. And I'll give thanks to him in front of these people who think I'm crazy. Number two, it took courage for, to stand in front of all these and give thanks, declaring that God is here. Because what are those sailors going to say? This man is a fool. He has lost his mind. He doesn't grasp the gravity of the situation that we're in. He's giving thanks to his God. But that's exactly what we need to do when the storms come. Do we just accept good things from God's hands and not the bad things? That's what Job asked. He says, who am I to complain to God about the harsh things when I've been blessed with all the good? I put my trust in God that he's the God of the storm. And number three, it took courage to go through the things that he didn't expect. Did Paul expect to be lost at sea, he had an inkling that something was going to happen. The sailors didn't. The sailors thought they were going to be fine. And now, two, three weeks later, they're out at sea, completely hopeless, completely helpless. They didn't ask for it. And there are things, there are storms that come to us, things that we don't ask for. We don't know when we wake up in the morning where we're going to be that night. We don't know if the retina is going to detach and we're going to go through this god-awful procedure. We, we don't know where we'll be tonight. 
We are no we don't know when the doctor's going to say that's cancer. We don't know. We don't expect the miscarriage. We don't expect the downsizing of our company. We don't expect that awful season of childhood that we had to go through. There's so many things that we don't expect, and sometimes we throw our hands up. God, why? Where are you? And Paul says, you're right here in the middle of my storm. And I thank you for your presence. Sometimes the, stay, the waves and the storm, they just keep coming. They keep crashing, and we, thunder, we ask, when is it going to stop? Give me a break. Two weeks. And Paul kneels down and gives thanks to God. You see, I don't know what's very best for me. And I'm pretty sure you don't know what's best for you either. We think we do. We think we've got it all figured out. And then we pray for it, and we wonder why it doesn't happen. Those, those of your parents know exactly how that works, don't you? You see a bigger picture than your young children have, and you could give them what they need. You can give them what they would ask for if they had the same understanding and vision that you have. And doesn't God do that for us? He sees a much bigger picture. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. He does. And so we need to practice the courage of trusting in him for that. The last thing the crew wanted was to, to be shipwrecked. But that was exactly what they needed. If they didn't crash on that shore, they were headed out to the middle of the Mediterranean where they would never be found. They needed a shipwreck in the worst way. We pick up in verse 39, it says, When daylight came, they didn't recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach, and they decided to run the ship aground if they could. So cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea, and at the same time, you untied the ropes, held the rudders. They hoisted the four sails into the wind and made for the beach. I can just see this. Guys, we're going ashore. It doesn't matter. This is the last-ditch effort. We are headed to the sand. But the ship struck a sandbar before it got to the beach, and it ran aground, and the bow stuck fast and wouldn't move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. Can you imagine? Put yourself there. It's still a long ways to the shore. And it's not just a calm little bay. It is a raging storm. And the, sh the waves are crashing. And they have destroyed the ship. There are 276 people on this ship. And the soldiers plan to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion, who'd been talking to Paul, he wanted to spare Paul's life. And he kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest were to get there on planks or other pieces of the ship, which was falling apart, and there were plenty of them. And in this way, everyone reached the land safely, all 276 of them. That's a successful landing. And everybody walks away. They didn't ask for that, but that's exactly what they needed. That's what they got, and then once safely ashore, in chapter 28, they found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness, and they built a fire, and they welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. And Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driv that's a snake, that's a poisonous snake, <laughs> driven out by the heat, fastened himself on Paul's hand. Fastened. And not just a little deep. He's hanging there. And Paul's going, ah. And shakes him off in the fire. And if you were Paul, and you'd gone through two years of jail, stuck on a ship again with 275 other people in this little boat, prisoners, most of them, most of them in chains, you sail into the storm. For two weeks, you've been without food and, and being battered by the sea. Now you get shipwrecked. You've been thrown into the water. You make your way to the beach. It's cold. It's raining. You try to 
warm yourself, and you get bit by a snake. When do you look up to God and say, God, come on. Really? Is this? Are you here? When do you give up? Paul didn't. Shake that thing off in the fire. I've been shaking faster than that. But Paul shook it off in the fire. The islanders looked at him and said, that man must be a bad man. He must be a murderer because look what the gods are going to do. He escaped the waves, but they're going to kill him anyway. The God of justice has spoken. And they watched him. And nothing happened. They expected him to swell up and die. And he didn't. And so they changed their mind. They said, this man must be a god. Isn't that funny? Pickler, people are fickle. And we see things and we, we form quick judgments about it. But Paul took advantage of what God was doing. God called him to a purpose. And so there, even though the people were calling him names, even though the people were judging him harshly, he listened to God. And he took an unfortunate situation, and he said, God is in the middle of this, and I will use it. And he spoke the word of God to those people in Malta, and they listened to him, and the kingdom grew. But it takes courage to trust in God's wisdom. I heard a story about Milton Cunningham, a missionary. He was back in the United States going from congregation to to his supporters. He was taking a flight from Atlanta to Dallas. As he sat down, he sat down next to a, a, a young girl who he could see quickly was suffering or had Down syndrome. He sat down next to her and she reached over and tugged on his, show, on his shirt and said, Mister, did you brush your teeth today? And he said, well, yes, I did. She said, that's good. Everybody should brush their teeth every day. Tug on sleep. Mister, do you smoke? And he said, no, I don't smoke. He says, she said, that's a good thing because if you smoke, you'll die. He said, oh, that's, that's, yeah, that's right. Tug on his shirt again. He says, mister, do you love Jesus? And he said, well, you know, I do love Jesus. And she said, that's good. Everybody needs to love Jesus. Well, the plane was about to take off, and in rushed a, a last-minute passenger businessman, sat down on the other side of Milton. Sat down, immediately pulled out his book, put his headphones on, had the whole aura, I'm important, I'm busy, don't bother me. Milton said he felt this tug on his sleeve. Mister, ask him if you brushed his teeth. <laughs> Milton said he Okay. He says, sir, did you brush your teeth this morning? <laughs> the guy looks at him crazy. Well, yeah. He said, well, that's a good thing. Tug on his, tug on his shoulder. Mister, ask him if he smokes. Well, Milton now is getting worried because he knows where this is going. But to please his, his little passenger friend there, he said, sir, did you, do you smoke? He says, no, I don't smoke. Well, that's good. That's good. Tug on the sleeve, mister, ask him if he loves Jesus. Milton's whole life is about asking people if they love Jesus. And yet at this moment on this airplane with this man sitting right next to him, he said he didn't want to ask the question. What is this man going to think of him? This lunatic who's asking a stranger if he loves Jesus. But the little girl wouldn't relent. Mister, ask him. And so he did. He leaned over and said, sir, my, my friend here wants to know if you love Jesus. Milton said the man's face darkened. And then it softened. And then it looked sad. The man took off his headphones. He says, you know, I'm going through kind of a hard season right now. And I need to search for God, but I, I, I just don't know how. And so for the next two hours on the way to Dallas, 
he shared with his man how to search for God. But it seems like the positions that sometimes we're placed into, we think, God, that's not, I can't do that. I, I just... It's not the right timing. It's not the right place. It's not the right person. It's not the right setting. It's, we have all the excuses. And Paul says, have courage in all of the situations to speak the love of God and what he has done for us. And God has given us that mission as his disciples to spread the word, to make other disciples, and to share. You see... Sometimes we're interested in getting to where we want to go. But the journey on the way is the important part for us right now. Whether it's in a storm or whether it's in the sunshine, to put our trust and our courage, let our courage grow as we put our trust in God, that he has got a plan and he is working things out. We're going to sing a song. It's taken from Joshua. We talked about Joshua earlier in this year, or last year, about being people of courage. Where the angel of God speaks to Joshua, and he says, Joshua, take courage, because I'm with you everywhere you go. And God is calling us to be people of courage, to speak his name, not to be idle, not to take it for granted, but to be active. Speaking and doing in season and out of season is what Paul tells Timothy. When it's convenient and when it's inconvenient. When the setting's right and when the setting's all wrong. Be people of courage, trusting that God is at work. And he will take the little things we do and grow them into something grand. So we put our trust in him. We put our trust in him when we give our lives to him. When we surrender to him. When we're baptized into the name of Christ, we are baptized, we die to ourselves. And Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And we die to ourselves and God is glorified because we then can be his instruments of peace and joy in the world. When we walk with courage, when we actually put our trust in him. But he says, first come to me. Let me put my spirit in you and enable you to do more than you can ask or imagine. I say those words because they're from the Bible. But I need to take those words into my heart. And with courage, really put my trust in those. God's at work. If you felt distant from God, you might need to be praying about that. And our elders are standing in the back saying, let's pray. Let's go to God and let's talk to him. So if you're ready to give your life to him or you need to pray to him, Let's do that now before we stand and sing this song.